Good morning. I just want to start off by saying for all the Duke fans, sorry, sorry, sorry. Carolina won yesterday, if you didn't know. Coach, Coach K's last game. Sorry, sorry, sorry. These first two songs, um, I've gotten several comments this morning saying, you're going to be singing a solo by yourself. <clears throat> These were in our songbook. Number six and number seven for uh, before our uh, opening prayer this morning, which will be led by John. Um, kind of nostalgic. It took me back to my Lutheran days, so kind of high church. But we'll sing. Because these may be familiar with uh, for you, we're going to sing all the verses and let you guys get to know them. So, let's sing. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden gleam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, oh, praise him, oh, praise him, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise him, alleluia. Thou raising morn in praise rejoice, ye lights of evening find a voice. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thou flowing water, pure and clear, make music for thy Lord to hear, alleluia. Alleluia, thou fire so masterful and bright, that givest man both warm and light. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let all things their Creator bless and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia! Praise, praise the Father and the Son and praise the Spirit, free and one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Yeah. <coughs> Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent, as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice, like mountains, I soaring above, thy clouds, which 
are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small. In all life thou givest the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree, and wider and perish, but not change us thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, all help us to see, is only the splendor of light I have been. Yeah. Let's stand for our, for our prayer this morning. As Dan mentioned, the war is unreal. And at this time, let's go to a moment of prayer, some silent prayer for the war and the people there. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you have spared our lives down to this moment that we are allowed to assemble here and worship thee in spirit and in truth. We ask to be with the leaders of this congregation, be with the elders as they make the decisions each and every day. Be with each and every member of this congregation as we work into our spares, places in life who will spread, spread their word. We ask to be, be with the war that is going on now at this time. Be with the leaders of the nations that peace will prevail. We're so thankful, Heavenly Father, that we are all peaceful here in this country. It's so sad to see the disaster that's going on. We ask you to intervene and cause peace. We ask you, Heavenly Father, be with us sick. We have several on our sick list. Be with them and the medical staff as they comfort them and put them back in their normal life. Be with those that's lost loved ones. Those that comfort them is only you know how. We have several that's on the road this day and time. We ask you to be with them, give them safe journeys as they continue their trips. And with those that visited with us, give them a safe return to their home. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. There was a young man named uh, Wallace Hartley, born, born in um, July of 1878, very normal individual. He uh, grew up, joined the British Army, and uh, served his time in the Army, then got out and come a, became a bank teller. <clears throat> he always had a love of music, though, and he became a master violinist, and he wanted to become a conductor. And then he was presented with a dream job, one that uh, he thought would get him on the road to uh, stardom as the band leader on the RMS Titanic. He died on the 15th of April, 1912. This song, uh, you might have seen it in the uh, movie Titanic, but this song is what he played as death was approaching. Um, the band leaders, you know, death was imminent, the ship was sinking, all lifeboats were away. They were only taking women and children. <clears throat> so he looked at the uh, band and said, God be with you. Hope everything's all right. Take care of yourselves. And as they went off, he started playing this song. And some of the people in the lifeboats said that they could hear a violinist playing this song. And then the band came back with him. And they played until the ship sank. So... I think this is really neat about this song. We live in a world now where 
uh, music takes us back to a different time, a, uh, sometimes a uh, very joyful time, but it also comforts us. And as we get closer, once you get up to this stage of the ball game, you know, you're uh, closer and closer and you watch people die. You think about songs that give you comfort. And this is one of them. So we'll sing all. And preparing us for uh, Sterling's uh, message this morning on the uh, communion. But we'll sing all the all verses. <clears throat> Nearer my God to thee. Nearer to thee. In the head be across that raiseth me. Still, all my song shall be near my God to thee. Since last month when I was invited to lead our thoughts together in, in communion, the Lord's Supper, and then our giving. And um, so things that came into my mind 
Um, I related to things I might share throughout this month. I've been reading a book of essays by C.S. Lewis, and he had a less than one page short essay on um, what he titled Holy Communion. You know, he was from Church of England, Episcopalian background. <clears throat> And uh, that's what they call it. He lamented the division that's among different peoples that go under the name Christian and their differences, um, sometimes with strong opinions about how we should commemorate the Lord's Supper. Uh, he also commented about something that Jesus said. And I'm going to read the scripture context of the remark that he made. You know, the, the gospel accounts tell us about Jesus instituting what would become the Lord's Supper. And uh, the setting was the Passover, normally celebrated in households, families, maybe some of more than one generation. But in this case, it was a gathering of all men, Jesus and his disciples. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When Jesus said, Taking the bread, that they ate in the Passover to remember their bondage and deliverance from slavery in Egypt. And the unleavened bread that they prepared to be able to eat in haste and to carry with them, to sustain them for a while on their journey. They associated that bread that he had held up and gave thanks for with that tradition. But he said, this is my body. What could they understand about that at that time? Maybe not much. And sometimes our understanding of what we do when we share in the, the Lord's Supper is limited. But we know that their understanding grew the very next day when they saw his body mutilated and flogging. When they saw his body nailed to the cross. When they saw the blood flow, when the crown of thorns was placed on his head and from his hands and feet, they would understand more about what he meant when he said, this is my body. And each time, because in another uh, gospel account, we're told that he also told them to remember. They would have plenty to remember. We have plenty to remember too. The Apostle Paul gave some instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. So here we're giving, given instructions for inspired words by the Apostle Paul that 
This is also to draw us together in realization of our body, the church, for which Jesus gave his body. Let's give thanks as we prepare to take the bread. And um, I hope everybody that's participating has a little reset. There are some in the foyer. I meant to mention that earlier. Let's give thanks before we break the bread together. Father, we're thankful that Jesus gave us this simple way to remember him. There's so much to remember of the way that he gave his body in his walk among us, the way that he tirelessly served, and we, we thank you for the body that he gave in our stead, taking our place, dying the death that we deserve for our sin, that we could be brought together back to you and closer to each other. We give thanks now, and we remember his body as we take this bread. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now also give thanks for the cup. Lord God, we thank you that you provided the perfect sacrifice that we need. We had nothing to give you that would restore ourselves to you. Jesus gave his perfect, precious blood to bring us back into fellowship with you, to pay the price for sins before the cross and since the cross, till we're called home to you. We confess that we have sinned and that we need forgiveness. And we thank you for providing the mercy and the atoning sacrifice by letting your son take our place. Thank you for the blood that this fruit of the vine reminds us now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're also going to take time now to uh, lay by in store as we've been prospered. We have many ways that we can give to the works that this church has undertaken in the name of Christ. There's a plate in the foyer into which you may drop your gifts. We can also give online or mail checks to the church building. And let's give thanks for our blessings and this opportunity to share in God's work. Father, we acknowledge that you have blessed us. We're thankful for the health that allows us to be here today. And we're thankful for the works that are being done. In Jesus' name, we pray that they will bring glory to him and to you. We ask you, as we give in faith, to continue to bless us with the things that we need. We ask you to bless us in your wisdom more than in our asking. And we pray that our faith will grow as we see the works that we contribute to bring glory to you, bring people to you. 
We thank you for the privilege of participating in your work. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be reading Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. This will be the song for our lesson this morning. <clears throat> In heavenly armor we enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon is fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He raised up a standard, the power of his blood, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is here. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Good morning. <clears throat> So this morning we are continuing the series that we started last week, which is titled, What They Need You to Know. And as I said in last week's lesson, I talked with a few adults and I asked them what they thought the youth need to know. And then I talked with a few of the youth and I asked them what they thought our adults need to know. Now, I only talked with four adults. And I only talked with four of our youth. And so this wasn't a widespread thing. This was just a, a brief sit down with a handful of individuals. But just with those few, I got a lot of material to work with. And as I mentioned last week, my two lessons turned into five just with those few. So I had to cut it off uh, with how many people I actually talked to. So last week, I was mostly talking to our younger people. It was what the adults need our youth to know. And this morning, we're going to continue on with that and continue talking to our younger people. Last week, we left off with the comments about putting in the work. And we were talking about how our faith does not just come to us naturally. We actually have to do something about our faith. We have to work 
on our faith, to strengthen it and build it. And the question is, what are you doing to strengthen and build your faith? And so going along with that and just picking up where we left off, one of the comments from an adult is that it's important to expose yourselves to other voices. Listen to deep thinkers and try to broaden the way you see God and see the world rather than just through your family's eyes. That is a big part of putting in the work. If you are taking God seriously and you're taking your faith seriously, then you are going to want to know everything you can about it all. And if you're just listening to me talk on Sundays, then you're only getting one perspective from me. And that's it. And as I said last week, your faith has to be your faith. It can't be your families. It can't be the preachers. It can't be your Bible teachers or the elders or whoever. It has to be your faith. And establishing that faith means you need to get lots of different perspectives to help you understand. You need to put in the work of thinking critically about all sides of the issue. You need to do the hard thing of actually investigating what's being said, whether it's from your family or your Bible class teachers or from me, whoever it is. You need to think critically and study and work. Something that has been very beneficial to me in my own personal study is that I will read books, I will listen to podcasts, I will watch YouTube videos about certain Bible stories or scripture that doesn't always make sense to me. I might be struggling with whatever it might be. I, I will look at these outside sources and what I'm reading and hearing and watching, believe it or not, does not always come from Church of Christ preachers. And so sometimes I'll read something or see something or hear something and I'll think about it and I'll say, well, that's just wrong. That doesn't even make sense. That doesn't add up. That doesn't match the rest of Scripture. And sometimes I'll hear something or read something or see something and I'll say, huh, I had never thought about it that way before. That really does make sense. That gives me a whole new perspective. In 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling, word of truth. It is important that we rightly handle the word of truth. So, are you working to do that? Are you listening to all the different voices out there that can actually help you do that? David writes in Psalm 25 verses 4 and 5, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all the day long. The question is, how are you going to know his ways and paths? Unless you're trying to find those voices that are going to help you find those ways and paths. Help you understand. And going along with this, of those voices, those different perspectives, is another comment from an adult. Look to other members of the congregation as mentors, other than just Michael and Jason. There is a lot of knowledge and ability in our older generation. You know, I am honored that I get to be a mentor to some of the people here that are younger than me. And I know that Jason feels the same way. I've been able to help some of our younger people in some very hard times through some very difficult issues when they are really struggling at the lowest of their lows. It is a privilege and honor to help that, to make any sort of impact on your life and help you through those struggles is something I cherish and I know Jason cherishes. But you've got an entire congregation sitting right there that would love to help you do the exact same. You've got an entire family right here in this room that would love nothing more than to get with you one-on-one -on -one and pray with you and study with you or talk through some issue that you are struggling with. There is a lot of knowledge and ability right here in this room. Not only that, there is a lot of experience right here in this room and they can help you. That knowledge and ability and experience, though, is not always being taken advantage of 
the way it could be. And our adults want you to know that they are here for you. They want to help you. They want to be involved. They want to walk with you on your faith journey. Galatians 6 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Our adults actually do, believe it or not, want to help bear your burdens. They want to be involved in your life and to be a source of encouragement for you. When you've got something going on and you don't know where to go, this should be the first place you look. This should be the first place you turn. This is where you come to find answers, and to find comfort. That being said, you don't always see that. You don't always feel comfortable with that. And that's actually going to be something that we talk about more in depth a few weeks down the road. Something else that was said by our adults. Women do play an important role in our church, but sometimes people don't understand that because they don't see it in the worship setting. This is one of those things that comes up a lot when we start talking about differences between us and, and all the denominations out there. This kind of goes along with what we talked about last week about us being different, but there's a reason why. There's a reason for us being different. And some girls can be discouraged by the fact that there isn't a role in the worship service for women. Now, some women, my wife included, are quite thankful for that. She would tell you she's very glad that it's left to the men, and she isn't expected to get up in front of anybody and do anything. But for other women, it can be a little bit discouraging. But to this comment, what you need to know is that even though you don't see women leading in the worship service, women are still leading. They definitely are. They are still very, very, very important to the work of the church. And I think many of the men here will admit it's the women who are really getting things done. They are the ones who are making things happen. Perhaps we don't always do a good enough job of pointing this out and highlighting just what it is the women are doing. It can sometimes become more of an unspoken thing that we know happens, but we just sort of take it for granted. And because of that, sometimes the outside perception can be that women don't have an active role in the church. That is not true at all. As you come up in this society, you're being inundated with this idea that women have to do all the same things that men do. The reality is we don't want women doing everything men do, nor do we want the men doing everything the women do. We don't want that. We have different roles to play within the church, and Scripture does tell us that. The same guy who wrote the Scripture about women keeping silent in the worship service he also wrote a whole bunch of praise and called out women by name for all the wonderful things they were doing, for all the work they were accomplishing, for how they were contributing so much to the cause of Christ. The Apostle Paul sets the guidelines for how we conduct our worship services, and then he points out all the women who are making such a difference in his ministry and doing the grunt work and getting things done that sometimes men are not getting done. So with all that being said, that is something you need to be aware of. The adults do, you, do want you to know just because there is a perception about women doesn't mean that perception is true. Women here play a key, crucial, and important role. Here's another comment that I think is very important. We want the kids to be leaders. We want you to take those opportunities and be active in the worship services. Does God see you stepping up and being the young people you should be? I think I've mentioned before that when I was baptized many years ago, the very first thing I was asked was what I wanted to do in the services. Do you want to lead prayer? you want to read scripture? Do you want to lead songs? Will you do the Lord's Supper? Will you give a devotional on Wednesday nights? What are you going to do? And even though I was asked what I wanted to do, 
there was an expectation, I will do something. And there was an encouragement to do as much as possible. Today it's a lot harder. And honestly, sometimes it is like pulling teeth trying to get some of you young men to participate. And there are reasons for that. I know that many of you have your reasons, and they are valid reasons for being so hesitant to do any of that stuff. But what you need to know is that the adults actually do want you to step into those roles. The adults want you to take on responsibility and to be leaders in this church. You may not see it, and you may not think it, but you actually have something important to contribute to the cause of Christ. In fact, next week we're going to be switching the lessons around, and I'm going to be telling the adults what the youth need them to know. Well, why are we even doing those lessons? Because you youth actually do have something to contribute. You do have insight. You have things to say. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no one despise your, you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. When you are young, it can feel like there's really no place for you. Sometimes we can create a culture where you have to be older to actually do anything. There's an old saying about the role kids should play in society. Children should be seen and not heard. Right? There was an attitude. We want, we want to see you running around. We want to see you here. We, we want you in the pews. Just keep your mouth shut. Don't make too much noise. Keep it down because the older people are doing important. I don't believe that's how it should be. And I don't think the adults here believe that either. Galatians 3, 27, 28, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In our leadership class last week, Andy mentioned that the average lifespan in the New Testament was 35. If that's the case, how old were their elders? How old were their deacons? How old were the people leading their services? Now, there were a whole lot of differences between life then and life now, but the point is there isn't an age requirement for who can be a leader in the church. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That means the 13-year-old is just as much a part of this church as the 73-year-old. As you come of age, what we want is for you to start stepping up into those leadership roles. You're going to be the future of the church. So the sooner you can start learning how to do that, the better. The more practice you get at it, the better. We want you to start taking the reins. When you're young, that's when you need to start asking yourself, what role will I play in the church 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Will I be an elder one day? Will I be a deacon? Am I going to be up there doing the Lord's Supper? How am I going to be leading the church? And then start taking on some of those responsibilities so you can figure out just what it is you're good at and what you can do. When I was in high school, I was a song leader. I started leading songs around 14 or 15. I did that up until about the age of 17, and that's when I realized I really don't have a voice for this. This probably isn't going to be my thing, probably not going to last, and you know what? That's okay. You don't know that until you tried it, and you tried it multiple times. One more comment from the adults that I want to address as we bring this lesson to a close. <clears throat> when people derail you, remember that they're people too. They're struggling too, and you should not take it personal, but keep on loving. You ever had a bad day and get snippy with someone? 
You didn't mean to. That wasn't really your intention. But that's what happened. Well, guess what? Adults do that too. We should be encouraging you in the youth. We should be building you up. We should be supporting you and helping you be the young people that you need to be. And the reality is, we don't always do that. Believe it or not, the adults struggle as well. Sometimes we've got problems in our lives. Sometimes we come in here on a Sunday morning and we are not at our best. Sometimes we're fighting just to get through the day. And so when you're trying your best to be the person that you should be, and then an adult gets snippy with you, or says something that comes across as really negative, and they just totally burst your bubble and bring you down, do not take it personal. Because that's not on you, that's on us. That's our problem. Something that Jason and I discuss quite often is the fact that our youth today are a lot more sensitive to things than when we were growing up. It's a generational thing. And the problem is sometimes we don't realize that. We don't take that into account. You're growing up in a very different world than we grew up. Sometimes we have a way of hurting you or bringing you down, and it was never our intention. We did not want that to happen. In fact, we didn't even know it was happening. Proverbs 12 and verse 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Do we ever use rash words with you? Sometimes. Sometimes that happens. And it cuts you, and it hurts, and it can cause you to not want to be part of things. It can cause you to not want to participate in things, but what you need to know is that you should not take our bad days as an indicator of who you are or how we see you. I know that for some of you, we tell you we want you to be leaders. We want you to step up. And so then you do. And you try something. You put yourself out there. You get out of your comfort zone to do something. And then after it's over, an adult comes over and tells you everything you did wrong. They don't tell you what went right. They tell you how you need to improve. That is a huge discouragement. But we need you to know. Don't let that be a discouragement. Don't take that personal and don't let that derail you and knock you off your path. We truly do want what's best for you because we care for you, because we love you, and we want to see you succeed and thrive in your life and in your faith. All right, so we have spent two weeks on what the adults need our youth to know. And I hope that all of our youth that are here have taken these things to heart, that you will really think about them, chew on them, ponder them. Next week, we're going to switch it around, and we're going to talk to the adults, and we're going to discuss some of the things the youth want you to know. And I hope you'll come back for that, so that you can take those things to heart, Think about them and ponder them and chew on them and turn them over in your head as well. As always, we close with an invitation. And it's an invitation to come to Christ. Christ came to this earth because we struggle. Because we fall. Because we are sinners and we are not always the people that we should be. He offered himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. We have to make a decision about what to do with that sacrifice. Do we accept it or not? You need to be baptized, to be buried in the watery grave of baptism, and rise up again in the newness of life. This is your opportunity. If you have another need, if you need prayers, if you need help, if you need assistance, if things are not going right, if you are struggling and you just need something, whatever it might be, this is your opportunity as well. Please come. Always stand and sit.
burden you bear. Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard? Let's send a word with our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, the world is a rough place right now. All we can see is the misery that uh, Satan is doling upon us and having a playground in our head. Um, fear, grief, sorrow, all those are not your gifts. They are Satan's tools to make us doubt you. Help us to be strong because we call you Heavenly Father because like children, we come running to you for comfort. But we also need to remember to give you gratitude and thank you. Because you love us and you want us to be better and you want us to show others your way. Please help us in this path, Father, because there's a lot of sorrows that we need help. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 